Hey, and welcome to A Different Atheist Reads, A History of God by Karen Armstrong. I'm Christy, and in this week's episode, we are going to very quickly look at the last bit of what Karen does in her chapter three. Then I'm going to give an overview of chapter three to try to give a sense of what I think Karen is trying to accomplish and how I think this sets us up for chapter four. And then we're going to be done. So, shall we get going? In the last two videos, I discussed what I saw as a progressive Christology and why I think that in terms of an explanation that best accounts for the evidence we observe in the text, in terms of the theological perspectives of the men writing, that an historical Jesus makes the most sense. It's quite plausible to think that um, all the evidence can be explained by that theory. Now, I also want to say that uh, I'm not going to do it here within the a Different Atheist Reads series, but I'm planning on doing an expansion video on that notion of an historical Jesus where I want to explain the theory of an historical Jesus as a theory and and how I was using it in that video series and then also to respond to some of the questions and comments that came up because I don't I've been really busy with the qualitative election study of Britain and normally I'm quite good about responding to comments but I'm all my time has just been sucked up with that and when I haven't been sucked up with that I've been trying to keep my videos up so I thought that instead of responding to every person's comments I'm going to go through the comments from the historical Jesus video the two-parter and the other two parts and collect some of the questions and then do a response video I don't know when I'm hoping soon but it's on my to-do list I can promise you that in the first part of Karen's chapter, she talked a lot about various authors and their Jesuses, and I'm just going to pretty much race through the rest of this chapter, and I'll tell you more why once we get through it. Karen talks about how Platonism was an influential pagan philosophy that was in the world at the time. Karen then touches upon the influence of Platonism on early Christian thought, but she really just then moves on into listing off these various theologians and their perspectives. Justin Martyr was someone I had mentioned, I think, in the first video, and Karen ties him uh, to Platonism as well, saying that Christians were simply following on from Plato, so you see an increasingly in, a powerful influence of Greek ideas into Christianity rather than its Jewish roots. Then she discusses the Gnostics, and I think the Gnostics are a topic that really almost deserve their own series. So rather than me trying to summarize Karen's summary, what I'm going to do is I'm going to link the Dale Martin series on Gnosticism underneath in the D-Box, and that's the best way that you can understand the, ve the real variety of views about Jesus that were coming out by the sort of the start of the second century. So again, if we think about it in terms of the timeline, the Gnostic writings, which are the least Jewish and most pagan, do not show up until much later. There's there's some discussion about the go the Gospel of Thomas and the dates, the dating on that when I checked earlychristianwritings.com was anywhere from 50 to 140. So I'm not that familiar with the Gospel of Thomas because it is a more recent text, uh, but the, gospel, the Gnostic texts that we were more familiar with are certainly not from Paul's time or even Mark's, the one the author of Mark was writing, but they are from much, much later times and they are more developed and more pagan. So you guys can look forward to the Dale Martin lecture on Gnosticism. Oh, I found another example of Karen's hobby horse, so let's get it out for posterity. We're looking at here, page 117. These myths were never intended as literal accounts of creation and salvation. They were symbolic expressions of an inner truth. God and the Plimeria were not external realities out there, but were to be found within. Not at all. Not at all. Karen then breathlessly runs through Marcion and the Bible that he assembled that was very anti-Jewish and was the catalyst of many, I think, it's safe to say many scholars think, for forcing Orthodox Christians to start to put together books that they would find acceptable. She then does a chapter on Tertullian, she does a chapter on Clement of Alexandria, and I mean if there was stuff in here that was actually important to the book that would be fine, but really what I feel like this book is, is it's not, it's, it's like a, a museum where you walk through and you look at things, but you don't actually learn anything. So Karen is basically taking us through time going, this is this, and this is this, and that is that, and the thing that she's not doing is connecting it all into a larger narrative, right? So, I mean, I, I could go into each of these thinkers, but to be honest, she's just gonna dump 
Like she dumped all the stuff about Canaan and Babylon and the ancient myths and all that stuff. We've never seen that again. And so I don't think it's worth our time to go into every point Karen brings up because I don't trust that she's going to connect these points in some future time. If she does, I'll come back and do the work. But really, I think we're just going to blow through this stuff. She also then throws in three paragraphs on Origen, including mentioning that he was known for self-castration. That's great in a history of God. Really important stuff to have. Then Karen spends what I think is an inordinate amount of time on a guy named Plotinus, who was, when I looked him up on Wikipedia, he's not an obvious Christian. I think he interacted with a few Christians, but he was never a convert. The reason why Karen wants to cite him is because um, Plotinus becomes very important later as a way for Christian thinkers to justify ideas about God that are very different from the Jewish ideas. And they want to use the Greek ideas in order to do that because they prefer the Greek aesthetic. And she spends time here discussing stuff. And I'll just I'll, I'll give you a taste of why, why I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Together with the One, they formed a dyadad of divinity, which was in some ways close to the final Christian solution of the Trinity. Mind, nous, the first emanation, corresponded in Plotinus' scheme to Plato's realm of the ideas. It made the simplicity of the one intelligible, but knowledge here was intuitive and immediate. It was not laboriously acquired through research and reasoning processes, but was absorbed rather in the same way our senses drink in the objects they perceive. Seriously, I'm not going to go through this shit. We get from Karen, um, two pages before the end, what I think is the entire point of this chapter. She writes, Christianity was coming into its own in a world where platonic ideas predominated. And that's really what the point of this chapter was. Karen wanted to take us through the first ideas of Jesus that were very Jewishly located and it was a sect of Judaism, all the way to the point where it's now completely compatible with Greek philosophy. And I wish she would have said that to start out, because then this whole chapter would have made sense, but she doesn't. And that's why I'm loath to spend hours of my time understanding the religious perspective or the philosophical worldview of, of Plotinus, when I know in the next chapter she's going to talk about the Trinity, and we're probably never going to hear about this per perhaps again. And if it does come up later with Aquinas or someone else, well then we can just go back. But um, there's been so much investment and so little payoff that I'm a little bit jaded at this point. Looking ahead to chapter four, what Karen is going to do, what takes up the bulk of chapter four, is the debate about the Trinity. The evolution of and the debate about the Trinity. So this, when you look backwards, when we, if we were to look back now, we can kind of see that the, the, where we've come from is a collection of ancient people living in Babylon and then the emergence of Judaism. I've pointed out some of the big moments as we've gone along, like uh, centralization of worship and movements to monotheism and stuff and how that determined the Jewish religion's history. And now we're coming out of a a sect out of Judaism that is going to become Christianity, but this Christianity is basically being born through a Greek world um, transmission rather than its Jewish parentage, if we can call it that. So when we look back, you can see that she has some notion of a story. The problem is it's not a story about anything. It's a story about a whole lot of things. And she just calls all those things God, which pisses me off because that whole schema um, I had about the nature of God might come up again in the next chapter. But really, it's very difficult to, other than Karen's hobby horse about that people until, I guess, what, 300 years ago, never took anything literally at all. Everything is symbolic and mystical and meant to be a map to our insides. <sighs> Gotta stop bitching about her so much. Yeah, so I'm gonna try to get back to that schema to see if we can find the Jewish God and compare it to the Christian God by the end of chapter four. So in terms of moving ahead, my schedule is getting crazy, as I said, with my work commitments, my field research, the grant that I won. 
What I am going to try to do is be consistent, if nothing else. If, you know, I can't get a video out on Thursdays, I'm going to put a video up saying I can't get a video out and when I can. And all I can really do at this point is just ask for your patience. This is going to be a very, very busy couple weeks for me. It's also probably going to make my career. So if I had to choose between my YouTube videos and my career, I'm going to choose my career so I can keep making YouTube videos. <laughs> So it's not really a choice. Anyway, you guys are awesome and understanding and I appreciate that. Um, but so keep looking here every Thursday for another episode unless there isn't one. And I think that's probably the best way to proceed. So until next week when we confront the Trinity, I've been Christy, you are awesome. And I'll see you next time on A Different Atheist Reads. Bye.